All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Jerry. Uh, you'll know me on the Steam Workshop as Geronimo. And uh, here we have a General Motors Electromotive Diesel GP15. Uh, I'll be going through startup and operation of the locomotive. Uh, I've learned from my previous last couple uploads that uh, apparently I don't explain things very well uh, in the description. So rather than write it down and hope that people get it, I thought a video would be a little bit more uh, useful to everyone. So here we go. All right, and as for a little background on these locomotives, uh, I use two very similar locomotives daily at work. Uh, I work for the Union Pacific Railroad as a through freight uh, conductor. And we have two locomotives that are GP15s. One is numbered UPY715 and the other is UPY730. Uh, so I recolored them or repainted them uh, for the donk line uh, with similar numbers uh, because I had difficulty making uh, the Union Pacific logo for them. Uh, dimensionally, they are almost the same uh, as their real world counterparts, which lends them to be a little larger than uh, most of the locomotives you'll find in uh, Stormworks currently. All right, so as we progress through this tutorial, I will make every effort to avoid using railroad terminology uh, to avoid any confusion. I apologize in advance if I do. Uh, these locomotives are identical in operation. Uh, their only differences are, of course, the numbering, as I mentioned before, and the fact that they're actually facing back to back, or long nose to long nose, or long hood to long hood. Uh, this allows for operation to and from the Isle of Donk to the Komodo Terminal. Uh, they can be run and operated long nose forward, uh, and we'll get in a little bit more into that later. But uh, this is their only differences. All right, so let's get started. Uh, unfortunately, due to the dimensions and size of uh, American locomotives, uh, they barely fit on the track and in the shed. Uh, and because of their dimensions and size, I was unable to put ladders or grab irons, uh, at least functional ones, uh, on the locomotive. So you will be doing a lot of hopping around. Uh, your space bar will get a lot of exercise. So here we go. We'll uh, hop aboard here. And uh, first thing we're going to do is knock off or release the handbrake, which is located there. Uh, all that is is look at it like a parking brake for your car. Uh, if there's no power or if you're securing the locomotive for the night, uh, you will apply that brake. We'll then open our door here and enter. We can close it. Uh, inside here, uh, this cab is relatively anatomically accurate. Uh, it's as similar as uh, I can get it within the game uh, with a few little uh, things for you to enjoy. Uh, first things first, our panel here. Uh, up top here, we have a headlight control. We'll get into that a little more later. A hot engine light. This will turn... If you have a hot engine, which I'll get into a little bit in a minute, uh, this will turn blue and sound an alarm. Uh, we then have three breakers for lights. We have our number lights. Uh, if you have uh, one engine leading, and in the real world, if you have bulletins that are specific to that locomotive, you would turn on the number lights on that locomotive. Uh, so we'll pretend that uh, the U, or as I was, the DKL or DKY715 is our leader. So we'll have that on. Engine room light. Uh, this turns on a light inside the engine room, so we have uh, some light back there when we're working. And then platforms and step lights. Uh, these control uh, lights under the steps and a uh, few on the platforms as well. This is our isolation run switch. This connects. This switch connects the engine, or uh, the, the motor, to the uh, generator to provide power to the traction motors. Uh, if it's Isolated, the engine will remain on, uh, but not provide power. If it's in run, uh, it will, will do so. And then a emergency fuel cutoff and engine stop switch. Uh, this is the primary means that we use for stopping the locomotive. Uh, and of course, it can be used in emergency. All right, so we'll move over to our circuit breaker panel, which is behind this door. We'll open our two uh, latches there. And we're confronted with all our circuit breakers. The ones with black paint on them are required for the locomotive to be running. The ones in gray are uh, subsystems that are not necessary. But we'll talk through them real quick. 
So first things first, we need to have our battery knife switch up. This provides power to all other subsystems. We then have our local control, which provides uh, power to the control stand behind us and gives us the ability to control the locomotive. We have our fuel pump, which I think is self-explanatory, and our safety device. The safety device controls or protects rather the uh, engine from overheating, and by which I mean uh, if it overheats, it will sound an alarm and turn on that blue light that we mentioned earlier. Uh, in real life, uh, the only thing you can do to stop this from uh, being an issue is to shut the engine down and uh, call maintenance and have them uh, sort it out for you. And that's all you can really do here as well is just shut it down. Uh, but as I mentioned before in testing, uh, I, I disconnected the coolant system completely from the locomotive and it never once even came close to overheating. So I don't think you'll have to worry about that too much. Next, we have our warning devices. This is an a, uh, alerter or vigilant system uh, that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's a common system in America. Uh, it's this, the reset button for it is here and the light is here. If you're moving over 10 miles an hour, uh, it'll start beeping at you after so many seconds. Uh, I'm not entirely, sh I don't remember exactly how many seconds it was. Uh, when it does, you can push this button, that'll reset it, and that'll be the end of it. Uh, it's mostly, in real life, uh, if you don't acknowledge it, it will stop the train. Uh, dependent on your speed, it'll also uh, go off more frequently. Uh, I found it to be kind of annoying, so I decided to disconnect it from the brakes entirely. Uh, and now it'll just annoy you, uh, whether you're moving backwards or forwards. Uh, and you can turn that off if you'd like. You don't have to have that on uh, for the engine to run. But there it is. Uh, in real life, we would have it on. Uh, we have an auxiliary cab heater breaker. This controls uh, these two switches here, which just run little motors. And they're uh, supposed to sound like heaters. Uh, uh not unlike the real world counterparts. We have the radio breaker. This controls the radio here. Uh, if you'd like, you can uh, tone the dispatcher. So you come over here and you press five, one, two. Uh, and you can hear yourself pushing the keypad and it tones the dispatcher. If you'd like to do it again, uh, press zero, okay, and re-enter those three numbers, 512. Next, we have our headlight breaker. This controls the headlights on the long nose or back end and the headlights on the short hood end on the or the front. We have uh, the lights breaker. This controls all our other lights, our reading lights, uh, the number lights, the uh, engine room lights, all those lights. We have our air conditioner compressor breaker. Uh, this is not dissimilar to the heaters. Uh, it just makes noise. Turn the breaker on and uh, you have a high low fan speed. Again, just there to make some noise. Uh, just like the real things, they're pretty loud. We have a filter blower motor. Uh, this is not technically required for the engine to be on. Uh, in real life, it would be. Uh, and it runs a fan in the back, uh, which you'll hear when we start the engine. And the gen field breaker. Uh, this one uh, connects the generator uh, or provides power to connect the generator to the uh, uh, motor or the engine. All right, so we have our breakers on. We'll close that door and we'll walk back to start the engine. Walk back to this panel with this red uh, panel here, or marker, and uh, you'll see the engine start switching side. We'll click on that. And you're confronted with uh, three basic things here. Uh, we have a water level sight glass, which is uh, reading a reservoir of water, coolant water that's in here. Uh, it doesn't drop, the engine doesn't dump its water uh, if it gets cold, it's just there just for fun. Uh, it will drop slightly uh, when the engine's running, but uh, you don't have to worry about filling it or anything like that. We have our lay shaft over here, which is a direct connect, in real life, a direct connection to the throttle uh, or to the engine, uh, which allows us to throttle the engine up and down uh, from within this uh, cabinet here. We also have our run and prime switch. This is what allows you to start the engine. Uh, when we crank it, uh, we'll put it to prime, uh, so to speak, and uh, this will turn the engine over. After so many seconds, I believe I have it set at 15, it will uh, start the engine and uh, 
allow it to uh, start. Once it's started, we'll put it back to run or turn it off. So here we go. I've been running the batteries for a little bit too long, so uh, this is probably going to have a little trouble starting. There it goes. It's running. Turn that off. And then we can use the lace shaft lever to rev the engine up and down. Uh, on its own, it will return to zero. All right, the engine's now running. You can see our fan is running under the grate here. And uh, we are pretty much ready to go. The engine is pretty much uh, all set. All we need to do now uh, to allow it to move is move this isolation switch uh, to run. There's a little alarm go off. And uh, we'll move over to the controls here. The generator or engine run breaker needs to be in the up position. This will allow you to control the throttle or, and the reverser. A few other controls here. Short hood light. This controls the headlights for the short end of the engine, the front. And this controls the headlights for the back. We have our gauge lights, our horn, and the front end device. We'll get into that later. The alert reset bell, uh, the automatic or train brake, and the independent brake. The automatic brake, all it does is control the brakes for the cars behind you. It does not have any control over the locomotives. If you move this back and forth, it will not stop the engines. That's what this is for. This is an independent brake. Uh, this controls not only this engine, but any other engines we are connected to. And you notice that neither one of them are moving at the moment. That is because they are cut out. To cut them in, you need to use the brake stand cutout. Turn that on. And now we can control the brake. And we'll get a little more into that operation later. The independent works just as any other system, or just as any other brake would in any other vehicle in Stormworks. We have gauges for those systems here. The brake pipe is connected to the automatic brake. The brake cylinder gauge is connected to the independent brake. And we have a load meter here. With that said, this engine is now ready to run. All right, I'm now going to move back to our second locomotive and get it started. Uh, it's the same process uh, with one key difference. So I'll be back with you once I have this engine running to talk about those differences. All right, so I've gone ahead and got this uh, engine running. And uh, I'll show you what I turned on real quick and left off. And also what is different we'll have to set up differently on this locomotive versus the other one. So really quickly, these are the breakers I have on. I have the knife switch, local control, fuel pump, safety devices, headlights, lights, jet field, and a filter blower. Uh, the other ones we can leave off. Uh, they aren't necessary for this engine to run as a trailer or a rear end unit. Uh, next thing, we're going to need to mess with our air brakes a little bit, or our brakes anyway. Uh, you'll notice that this is reading a 2. This is because it's actually, both brakes are set up on both engines, and uh, it's reading a redundant number. So we'll need to remove this system from the brakes and allow the other engine to control this engine, plus the rest of the train. I chose to uh, not complicate the brakes uh, like the real world counterparts. Uh, first of all, I don't have the time for that, and I didn't think it was necessary for the engine. So, First thing we're going to do is we're going to cut in the brake stand and we're going to release the independent. Now it goes to one. One is the application is receiving or the brake setting is receiving from our leader. So that's good. The brake pipe is still set at 0.77. That's because you're at 77. Uh, we're going to leave that there uh, in the handle off position, so to speak. And to do that, we cut it out. And now these brakes have no control over what the rest of our train is doing. We're going to turn the headlight switch on. Uh, this is so we have a marker so uh, other trains don't run into us. And then we're going to come over to the headlight control. We didn't discuss this on the other engine because it's on by default. We need to turn it off. This is important. If you don't do this, it does two things. One, it controls the headlights. It shuts off the ditch lights or the lower two lights on the locomotive down there. It leaves that on as our marker. 
The other thing it does is it controls the polarity of our uh, motors. So when that engine on the other end is running forwards, this one knows to run backwards. If this one's running forwards, it knows forwards. That one will run backwards. Uh, so it reverses that. So that must be off if this is a trailer engine. Uh, we'll then turn this to on to connect our local motor, or excuse me, the diesel engine to the generator. Last thing we'll do is we'll take the handbrake off. And with that said, these locomotives are ready to move. Close all our doors. Head back over here. Hop over. Open the door. Climb in. Turn the headlight on. Brakes are cut in. We'll release both. You'll hear the uh, exhaust. That is a compressor running. All it is is an engine trying to start. It's there for noise, but it's actually uh, supposed to simulate the compressor recharging the brakes. Uh, independent is independent is off, and the automatic brake is off. We'll put the reverser to full reverse and start backing up. And I will back the train up. I'll show you the next step that we gotta get. Alright, so the next thing we have to do is connect to, or couple up to, or tie on to our cars, which are our environments. You can see the alerter system is going. This is because I went over 10 miles an hour. Reset it. Push that button, and it'll turn on. To move forward, I'll move the reverser forward. All the way. Really see it depend a little bit. Two tunes. Mill on. So I wanted to take a moment to, uh, before we couple up here, I wanted to take a moment to talk about the car that I'm including in this pack. This is a tank car. Uh, it's a 28,000 gallon, uh, uh, 61 foot tank car, uh, I believe are the specs for it. It's like 101,000, uh, 101,000 liters, uh, of, uh, diesel fuel, uh, which is pretty darn close, about 500 gallons too much, actually, uh, for a realistic tank car. Again, scaled correctly. I was unable to have the space to put ladders on the side. Fortunately, there's no reason to go up here. Uh, it's just aesthetics. Uh, if you want to fill the car, all the controls for that are beneath it, as well as uh, draining it. Uh, again, there's a fuel gauge there for, uh, for your convenience to see how much fuel you actually have in there. Uh, the cars themselves, they have uh, a braking system. Uh, they have a handbrake system, which is located here. Uh, not dissimilar to some other cars that you've probably seen in the workshop. The gauge for it is uh, hard to see, but there's a uh, ribbon gauge right here. Uh, the red line indicates uh, that it's either applied or released. Uh, Right now, I believe I have that one applied. Uh, they also have pin lifters. Uh, all this is doing is controlling the uh, or releasing the uh, air brake pipe here and the coupler itself. And I'll get into a little bit more with that in a second. But uh, these are the cars I'm including uh, with this pack. All right, so I've coupled up to the train. Uh, and I'm going to start going through the steps we need to accomplish for that. First things first, I'm going to apply the automatic brake, or train brake. This is again the brake that controls our cars. I'm going to remember this number, 0.57, that's how much brake application we've made. I'm going to walk out. Now, the coupler does not control 
the cars. There's a connection there, but it does not control the cars. Between the engines, uh, it does allow the air brake information and the power and the engine and all that information to go pass through. But this pipe underneath is what controls uh, the train brakes. All those hoses need to be connected in order for these cars uh, to talk to one another. So, in order to do that, we'll grab that one with Q. We'll grab this one with E. Fight them together, and they're good. So now these locomotives are connected to this car. This one's not, this is where it stops. So I will go in here, and I'll make these hoses. Just like in real life, an annoying process that uh, nobody really likes doing. I'm also gonna release the handbrakes, which I guess is already, it's already on. So I'm gonna release the handbrake and I'll catch up with you when I have all these hooked up. Okay, so we have all our air brakes connected. I'm gonna knock off this one last handbrake here and we're gonna talk about our next step. All right, so I have that handbrake off, uh, which now means that that application, that 0 0.57 that we made on the automatic brake is now being transmitted through these cars. Uh, so they do have air on them. Uh, they are capable of being stopped. But we would like to know if the uh, brakes are working. Uh, if you're doing yarding or uh, maybe local transfers, uh, this is a fine setup as it is right now. But if you're going over the road like we are to the Isle of Dunk, we want to know what the rear of our train is doing. Uh, in the old days, they would have used a caboose uh, with a brake gauge on it. Uh, nowadays, we use a device called an end of train device which uh, provides us with the brake pipe pressure of the rear of the train. It tells us if the train is moving. It has a marker on it, and uh, it can uh, actually cr uh, create an application. If the engineer uh, toggles a switch on the front head end of the train, it will uh, apply an emergency at the back and thereby stop the train quicker uh, than it would if it just released or uh, applied the ep or created the emergency from the head end. So, uh, we have uh, an end of train device. Uh, all this does uh, is provide a marker and a reading to the head end. It does this by connecting it to the coupler. Uh, first thing I would recommend is connecting the air hose. Uh, this can be very annoying. Uh, probably I've gotten a little practice with it. It gets its reading uh, from this Come on, move. From this plug here. This one is uh, just for mounting it. So you need to make sure that this plug is connected to that. So I grab this one. And I'm going to lift it up as high as I can. And we're on. That was easy. All right, so once it's on and connected, it's getting power. Uh, we have our marker, and it's connected to that. And we should see, if you move over the logic here, on this side, you'll see a 0 0.5667. So we are showing a uh, reading at the back of the train, which means uh, what we would call good continuity. At this point, we would start our air test, uh, but we don't have to do that. We can just uh, highball and get out of here. So I'll meet you on the head end. All right, so we're back. Uh, since I made this video, uh, folks over at Stormworks, the developers uh, had an update, which broke a few things, uh, but they improved a lot more, and I really Big shout out to those guys for uh, continuing to improve and make this game better. It's a, it's a real gem, and uh, I certainly enjoy it. So uh, anyway, where we left off yesterday, uh, we just finished uh, connecting all our cars together and hanging our end of train device. And before we get going, I wanted to show you guys how to switch ends. And that's why we uh, came and tied onto these cars with this as our leader in the first place. So I want to switch ends and by uh, switch control from the 715 to the uh, 730. And uh, so we'll climb aboard here, turn the volume down a little bit. I found out it was uh, very loud. So uh, hopefully you guys can hear me a little better this time. So first thing, once we're in here, uh, we'll lower the, or change the uh, headlight control to off. Uh, this is, again, it changes the headlight settings, but also reverses the polarity. So now this engine knows to run backwards when the other one is running forwards. Number lights, we'll drop those off to off because we'll make the other one our leader. We'll come over here and uh, we want to 
uh, cut out the brake stand. So to do that, uh, first thing we'll do is we'll release the independent brake and uh, cut it out. We're then going to uh, reset the uh, end of train to, or head end head end device, excuse me, and uh, switch it off and zero it out, as it were. Uh, you saw it releasing there for a sec, but uh, we want to cut this device out so we can use the other end. Uh, before I move on, one thing I forgot to mention: the reverser. It needs to be in order for it to work. It needs to be either full forward or full back. If you have it anywhere in the middle, it'll the locomotive will consider itself neutral. So make sure that you either have it full positive one or full negative one for it to work. We'll then drop the uh, run switch, engine run switch off, and we'll uh, turn the light on. So if we have to come back in the middle of the night, uh, we're not fumbling around in the dark. And that engine is uh, now in trail. So we'll switch ends here, hop across, hop across, and open the door. Climb aboard. Close the door. All right. We'll come over here. We'll switch the headlight control of this one to on. Number lights to on because this is now our leader. And uh, coming here to our breaker panel. Warning device is up. It's a little chilly today, so we'll turn the heater on. And our radio. Close that. We'll now cut the brake stand in. Full independent. And you can see our brake pipe is already set to 70, but our EOT is showing zeros. And that's because we need to arm this one. And now you can see it's showing 70 as well. Run switch to on, and the headlight is already on. So this engine is now our leader. All right, so we are ready to go now. Uh, one last thing you can do if you would like, uh, and that is cut in or activate our cab signaling system. Uh, as I mentioned, this locomotive was originally supposed to be painted in Union Pacific or UP colors. Uh, I ran into difficulties with that, so I went with the donk line. I thought it was more appropriate to the game, and I think more people will enjoy it. However, with that said, the locomotive still retains uh, some of the systems that you would see on a Union Pacific locomotive. And with that said, in uh, 1995, I believe it was, the Union Pacific acquired or bought the CNW, or Chicago Northwestern Railroad. Uh, and they used a s cab signaling system. And a cab signaling system works on the premise that it uh, picks up information or uh, a signal from the rail and will display that information to the crew in the cab. Uh, the CNW cab signaling system was a very simple, very old system. I believe they implemented it in the 1940s. Uh, and it basically had a two light system. It either displayed that the signal was clear or you could proceed, and uh, it only and the other one was a restricting signal. So whatever the next signal was, uh, it was not a favorable signal. So anything in between that, it didn't display. Uh, in game, the system is basically a speed control. When you enter a curve, uh, it'll warn you of it and slow you down. And we'll get a little more into that later. But uh, first thing we want to do is connect the system to the train. So when we come over here, this is the cab signaling system. Uh, on the left, you have the ATC, or Automatic Train Control. This is that CNW system. It's a three-light system. It's got green up here, and then a restricting indication down here, which is a yellow and then a red. This one is a motion light. Uh, it'll come on at three miles an hour to inform you that the system is operational. The right side is a ca coded cab signaling system. This was used by the Uni Union Pacific out west. Uh, I'm not particularly familiar with it, and in this locomotive, it's inoperative. So to turn everything on, we'll come down in the nose. Uh, we will stand up. And uh, this is, on the right side, the Union Pacific system. It's an operative. And on the left, we have the CNW, or Chicago Northwestern, system. To power it up, we'll turn that breaker on. And then the actuator needs to be turned on as well. Uh, the actuator connects the brakes to the system. If you have that off, uh, the system will light up and beep and squawk at you and make all kinds of noise, but nothing will happen. Uh, if you have the actuator on, uh, the brakes will operate, and if you don't do anything, the train will uh, stop. So by law, we have to have those both on on the real world. So we'll come up here, and a couple things have happened. One, you notice it's now displaying a uh, restricting signal, and this is because I have the reverser centered or in the middle. Uh, 
when we come over around the corner here, what will likely happen to you, I've been uh, messing with the system uh, off camera, but it will have applied the brakes fully. Uh, it didn't do that for me because, again, I've been playing with the system. I've been turning it on and off uh, while making this video. So what you will need to do, first thing, is acknowledge that, uh, that application, or what we would call a penalty application. You'll acknowledge it. The brakes will release and go to zero, and you'll see that uh, signal as well, or the uh, the release on the back of the train. Right now, I've got it set at 70.7. Uh, so what I'll do is our system is now operational. It's ready to go. I'll release the brakes. They'll release. I'll put the reverser forward. When I do that, it'll display a green or clear indication. And that is because there's a little distance center under the plow uh, that's picking up uh, that there's clear track ahead of us, at least more than uh, 250 meters. So it is now showing clear, which means we are good to proceed. I can uh, release the independent. Versus forward. I can give it a little throttle. You see the motion light came on because we're going over three miles an hour already. And we can go. And I'll come back to you in a little bit once we get a little farther down the line to uh, talk to you more about cab signals and their operation. Alright, so we're coming down to the end of the line here on the Isle of Donk. And I wanted to take this moment to talk to you about cab signals and how they uh, work on this locomotive. The locomotive has a distance sensor located on the front and the back that pick up this lip around the edge of the track as you go around corners. Anything over 90 meters in front of you uh, it'll display a clear indication or that green light will come on in the cab and you just can go as fast as you feel comfortable. Uh, anything under 90 meters the cab signal system will display a restricting which is that yellow over red light and it'll start beeping at you at which point you have five seconds to acknowledge uh, that indication. To acknowledge it you press the ATC acknowledge button That'll buy you an additional seven seconds to slow the train down. If you don't acknowledge that uh, signal, it will stop the train. It'll apply the brakes fully and then uh, also unload the locomotive or switch the engine to idle and uh, you will come to a grinding halt. To maintain a, uh, a speed so you don't have that system going off while you're going around the corner, uh, you can't be doing anything more than 17 miles an hour which is just under what in America we call restricted speed, which is a being able to stop within half the range of vision and not to exceed 20 miles an hour. And that's why they go with 17, because it's just under that 20 mile an hour limit. So uh, with that said, we'll hop in here and uh, we'll talk through what to uh, expect and how to react to it uh, in regards to cab signals. So here we go. So anyway, so we're cruising along at 44 miles an hour. Uh, I'm completely unconcerned with the railroad. I'm talking to my conductor about the ball game and uh, a cute girl he met down at the bar. And uh, we're completely unconcerned with anything going on around us as we come around into the corner here. And uh, as I said, we're doing 46 miles an hour. It'll, f as you can see, the cab signal has flickered a little bit. And now it's displaying that restricting or yellow over red. After five seconds, it will apply the brakes. And as you can see, it applied the brakes on the head end. The rear end of the train is responding in kind with the head end device. And it's also unloaded the train. And I never touched anything. Our speed is now uh, pretty much reduced to zero. To recover from what we would call a penalty brake application, the first thing I'm going to, redo, going to do is reduce our throttle back to zero and acknowledge the ATC. It now released the brakes on the head the rear of the train are coming down and I can now proceed. And you can see our speeds climbing up 13, 14 miles an hour. And it's over 17 so that system started beeping at us again. I'm going to reduce my speed slightly. That's the alerter. Press that. Now any good engineer knows his territory so things like that don't happen. So you'd be prepared to slow down before that. As you can see, the uh, track is straightened out enough that the system has decided the track in front of us is clear and is now displaying a green. 
However, we know better. Uh, so we're going to keep our speed low. But just, just for fun, I'll increase our speed just a little bit. Uh, to show you how to react to it. But we know that curve is coming up now. We're paying attention. At least partially. A good engineer would uh, keep his speed under 17. So anyway, so it started beeping. I'm going to acknowledge that warning, which will buy me an additional 7 seconds to get my speed down. If need be, I can apply a little brake. Which has brought my speed down considerably. I'll release the brake. You can hear the compressor kick on. And uh, I can pick a speed that'll, uh, or a throttle notch that'll uh, keep me under uh, 17 miles an hour. Now, I will be the first to admit that 17 miles an hour is extremely slow. Uh, and I wouldn't blame you if you don't want to be going 17 miles an hour. But as long as you have the system activated, it will uh, require you to do so. Uh, with that said, you can cut out or turn off the system on the fly while you're moving. Uh, but you cannot cut it out while, or excuse me, as I was, cut it in or turn it on while you are moving. So what we can do is we can come back down here in the nose, and the lag is pretty bad. I won't deny that. Uh, I would recommend not using anything more than four cars with these trains. I've tried it with eight, and it's uh, it's pretty bad. I get frame rates of about five. So anyway, so we'll cut the cab signal system out. Uh, just like I mentioned earlier, when you leave the bathroom, first thing you do is you flush the toilet, and then you turn off the light. And now our cab signals uh, have turned off. The alerter's still going, however, good old alerter. And uh, it's now disconnected from our brakes. And we can start cruising. Now doing over 20. I can pick up the pace a little bit. Again, uh, I... You can cut it out on the fly, but don't uh, cut it in while you're moving or we'll stop the train completely. You have to be at a complete stop. Anyway, uh, I'll get back with you when we get closer down to the uh, end of the line in the yard. All right, so we're coming down into the yard now. And as you can see, I'm going a little fast for the, uh, the yard here. Uh, 10 miles an hour is usually typical uh, yard speed. So I'm gonna slow down a little. I'm gonna reduce my throttle slightly. And uh, as we come on down here. Now these locomotives with both of them running uh, will produce enough power. There goes the alerter again. Produce enough power to uh, do what we call power braking or stretch braking. Which means that you have the brakes uh, applied on the train. But, not, uh, but you're still applying power. So you can kind of pull your cars along while the brakes are applied. Uh, and I'll demonstrate that here and now. So I'll apply a little bit of brake. And as you can see, we uh, we did lose some speed, but I can actually power through it a little bit. Uh, which will make it easier to stop later. When you're uh, stopping a train, you never want to use your locomotive brakes to do that. Because then all your cars or the independent brakes. Uh, because then the train will uh, come banging in on you. And you'll knock all your teeth out when you smash into the control stand. You always want to use your train to stop uh, or your cars to stop your train. So I'm coming down here at about 9 miles an hour. I'm picking up a little speed. I'm going to get a little more brake. Hold my throttle position. It cruise down to about 5, 6 miles an hour. Come out of the throttle. There goes that alerter again. I guess I was going over 10. And once I'm happy with where I want to stop, I'll just reduce the throttle to 0. Center the reverser. Usually you want to apply the independent first. That's So now our brakes are applied to the locomotives. And I'll apply just a little bit more throttle to hold the train. I'll put the engine run switch down. And if I'm going to be uh, relieved or switching ends or uh, the other crews coming to relieve me, uh, I'd leave the engine running. Uh, in this case, uh, let's just say I'm going to the hotel. So what I would do is I'd put my engine isolation switch to off. Again, make sure I got everything set up here correctly. And then I would hit the emergency cutoff for a second or so. It'll cut off the fuel to the engine, and uh, the engine should die. 
sooner rather than later. There it goes. All right. Once we have the engine cut shut off, we can come in here and we can shut our breakers off. It doesn't necessarily matter in which order we do them. Uh, but we uh, certainly want to make sure we have most of them off so we're not draining power overnight. And uh, the battery knife. The uh, one thing I should forgot to mention earlier, the emergency fuel cutoff. There's two of those located outside of the train on either side. Uh, one here over the fuel refill valve and the other one is over here. They have the exact same purpose. They're not used primarily for shutting the engine down. We don't do that, but they're identical and they can do that. Uh, if you let the batteries run low, there is a slave receptacle here, or recharge receptacle. You can hook up a generator uh, to recharge the batteries. So uh, we'll grab our uh, bags, our grips, and uh, head off to the hotel. All right, folks, I hope you found that video, uh, or found that video informative. Uh, as you may have noticed already, a lot of the systems on this uh, locomotive work similarly to their real-world uh, counterparts, but not exactly. Uh, some of that was intentional. Uh, some of that is also my own uh, shortcomings. Uh, I'm pretty new to the game and uh, have little knowledge of computer programming and how logic works. Uh, I'm learning. Uh, I'll get there. But uh, th I hope you... Uh, you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it informative. And if you have any questions, please, by all means, feel free to comment below. And uh, eyeball. I hope you guys have a nice day. Take care.